was, I guess he's, I don't think he's living, but he was a, some kind of preacher that wrote a lot of books and things. He says, we have to recognize that sin is a fact, not a defect. Sin is a red mutiny against God. Either God or sin must die in my life. If sin rules me, God's life in me will be killed. If God rules in me, sin in me will be killed. And again, that's Oswald Chambers. And we know Romans 5.12 tells us that by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all men have sinned. And the, with those words, we will go into the lesson, I sin because. Temptation is the first word. We sin, I sin, because I am tempted. That doesn't surprise you, does it, to hear that one? I sin because I am tempted. Temptation is the beginning of sin. We have a lesson on temptation. It's a lesson within itself. Not to go there today, but temptation is the beginning of sin. And you know that sin falls under three basic categories. In 1 John 2, 15 through 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. One of those three will fit the sin that you lifestyle that you choose in regard to sin. The word tempt or temptation is a two-way word. It can be the act of tempting or being tempted. If as a guest in my house or someone else's house, or a convention, or a restaurant, or whatever, if someone offers me a drink of alcohol, I say, no thanks. Okay, they go their way. But if they, then they say, oh, no, here, buddy, here, take a drink. Then he becomes the tempter, or she, whichever one's doing it. Then they become the tempter. And if I succumb to it, I become the tempted. But if I continue to say, no thanks, not interested, then I have not been tempted and we won't go any further than that. Tempting is something that is inviting or attractive, alluring, enticing, seductive, any of those, if they're not those, then it wouldn't be tempted. And we wouldn't be tempted. It wouldn't be called temptation if it wasn't for those, uh, that, uh, that description. So, not only do we have the obligation to resist such things, but to avoid them as well. James 1.12 if I can get my Bible up, I should be able to quote this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Enduring temptation is not succumbing to it, not giving in to it. And that is continual. The word enduring has the everlasting meaning to it. And it has been said that we gain the strength of the temptation that we resist. 
And it has also been said, and oftentimes when we think of temptation, this is the way of what we're thinking. Temptation is a woman's weapon and a man's excuse. Now, it's not always about women. Temptation is not. It's about pride of life. It's about lust of the eye. It's about lust of the flesh. But it's not always about men and women. Every moment of resistance to temptation is a victory. Again, if, if someone dangles something in front of me that I really like, then I might be tempted to take it. Food-wise, let's say food-wise. Uh, you, could, you could pour alcohol, a line of heroin, a, 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 a fat joint, any of that marijuana, and it wouldn't tempt me one bit. Not one iota. But if you hang a Twinkie in front of me, I might want that. I love Twinkies. I could eat one big as a football. But I, I don't normally. But I've never had, as I've said, I've, I've, I can't speak from experience. I've never had those addictions. I was addicted to, to uh, caffeine. I did smoke, nicotine, I mean. I did smoke. I, I smoked cigars. I smoked pipes. I smoked cigarettes. As Jerry Clowers, or maybe it was some other comedian, said, I would have smoked chains if I could have lit them. I was, I was a chain smoker. But when I, the day I quit, I don't think I've ever looked back. I've never wished for one. You could probably put one in front of me. Well, I know it wouldn't bother me the least bit. But if I ever smoke one, I might leave the store with a carton. Because they say once you're addicted, you never lose that addiction. You might conquer it, but you never lose it. So temptation works on us in a lot of different ways. I am tempted... Every man is when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. God doesn't tempt. God cannot tempt us. So says James. So when I, when I yield to temptation, it's not the God's fault. It's not Satan's fault. It's not your fault. It's my fault. Because I have the power to resist the temptation. It's in my attitude whether I'm willing to do it. But again, read that sentence. I am tempted when I am drawn away with lust and entice. Just seeing something sinful doesn't mean I am tempted. Just seeing a bad scene doesn't mean that I have been tempted. Only when it attracts me and when I am drawn away with my lust and enticed, and then it produces sin. When lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Okay. I said more than we intended to about that. I sin because I am selfish. We've already said from... Campbell's observation that sin always finds its root in our own selfish desires and self-gratification. Think about that one. If the things that we do that are wrong did not gratify, were not gratifying and did not please us, we wouldn't do them. We would not want to do them. 
We do things that we don't want to do that are not gratifying. Sometimes work is not so gratifying, but we go. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.19. They People, we seek our own. We seek our own pleasure, our own self-gratification when we are selfish and ignore God's word. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, etc., and so on. They shall be lovers of their own selves and sin because of it. I sin because I am stubborn. Yet they obey not nor incline their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. Jeremiah 11. And the word imagination there lends itself to stubbornness. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, because they were stubborn. And apply that to myself. Things that I have done that I knew I shouldn't be doing, it was because I was tempted, it was because I was selfish and stubborn. Wanted to do it my way. Wanted to do it regardless Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Harden there lends itself to stubbornness. Do not be stubborn. If you hear God's voice and hear his words, do not be stubborn. Obey the word. I sin because I am ignorant. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to their shame. 1 Corinthians 15. And then Acts 3. And now, brethren, I want that, I want that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers that is, crucified the Lord through ignorance. And people can sin through ignorance. And I'm going to give you an example that to me proves it wholeheartedly. And you've heard this before, some of you have anyway. A young lady that Austin, our older grandson, befriended while he and she worked at Winsels. Kim was living with her sister, and for some reason, the sister decided she couldn't live there. And Austin said to Brent and Liz, his parents, can Kim live with here at the house until she finds a place? They agreed. Very early on, and probably the first week, Kim went out for the weekend, and she was gone the entire weekend. When she came home, Brent said to her, there are rules here. If you're going to stay here, you will not do what you just got through doing. You won't spend the night with people, with boys especially. 
you will live under these rules. And she agreed to that. And then Liz started taking Kim to church, to Plainview. Kim had never owned a Bible. There was not a Bible in her house. She was from, I don't know where, Pennsylvania or somewhere up there. She had never even seen a Bible probably. So she did not know that what she was doing was wrong. She had never been told by her parents, by anyone, that it's wrong to spend the night with a guy. She didn't know it. You would think common sense would say that it's wrong. But she did not know. She admitted it. I didn't know it was wrong. She didn't do it again. She had been a Christian now for about 10 years. She was married, or she and her husband just moved from Florida back up to some, uh, the north, uh, north of Nashville, doing very well. She still has moments when she remembers her past, her growing up, and when she has to deal with anxiety. But Kim did not know that it was wrong to do what she was doing. People out there do not know. And it's sad that they don't. And it's sad that you can't get to them to teach them. Do you know of anybody that can relate to that? <laughs> yeah. And then there was a case that I made note of, and it was the case of Peter. When he stood before three different people and said, I don't know Christ. I don't know this man. And they kept saying, yeah, you do. And Peter pretended ignorance. He pretended not to know Christ. We might be able to do that. Pretend ignorance. I sin because... I'm tempted, I sin because I'm selfish, I sin because I'm stubborn, I sin because I'm ignorant, I sin because I am without armor. And you know the scripture, put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you part of the armor of God. Now, you know it doesn't say that. Take unto you the whole armor of God. And here's the reason why. That we may, or he may be able to withstand in the, uh, in the evil day. And having done all to stand. The armor being truth, righteousness, gospel, faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, prayer. Put it all on. And I sin when I am without it. I sin because I keep evil companions. Be not deceived. Evil communications, that is, companions, corrupt good manners, morals. 1 Corinthians 15. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Second Corinthians 6 and 14, we've heard that so many times. Unequally is to come under a different yoke. Unequally yoked. And the example is given of a farmer plowing uh, horses or mules, the 
the strongest animal will be in, put to the right, and it will be the lead animal. It will lead the weaker one. And the example we're given is that if you, we are unequally yoked and that unequal one is the stronger one, that's the one we will follow. I got ahead of myself. It's also to have fellowship with one who is not an equal. I can't see. It's used in Leviticus 19 of the union of beasts. That's the one I got ahead of. Uh, beasts of different kinds. You shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. And then there's the example of the, of the uh, beast of burden and the yoke that we just talked about. The strong one being the lead animal. So if you apply that to me being unequally yoked together with an unbeliever, am I going fishing with him? Am I uh, going uh, to different events with an unbeliever? And is he having an effect on me? Is he causing me to say words that I wouldn't say with you? Is he or she causing me to take action that I would not take otherwise? If that be the case, then whoever that friend is should be unfriended or at least not associated with. And that's just a fact of life. That's just a fact of the scripture. We didn't make that up. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? That's Proverbs 6. In Psalms 119, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. That's what I should be a companion of all those that fear God and of them that keep the precepts. But we, we worked around fire long enough to know that you can't play with it without being burned normally. You can work with it, but to play with it, you're in dangerous territory. And that's the way it is with being unequally yoked. It, maybe it'll work, but it's dangerous territory. I sin because I am curious. And you know the very best example of that Lot's wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt after being told not to look back. Now, I don't remember God saying or the angel saying, if you look back, you'll be a pillar of salt. He just said, don't look back. I would have looked back. I know I would have looked back. With your home being burned, with your friends and relatives being burned, and you're told, don't look back. And they're saying, let the past be the past. That, that's a sinful situation. It's being destroyed. Don't look back. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I would have looked back at my home being burned, my family being burned. She did, and she paid the price. But he would say the same thing to me. If you're leaving a sinful situation, Jack, don't look back. <clears throat> I 
I sinned because I considered sin trivial. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of, wish I could read, Ethbel, king of Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him, Ahab being king of Israel. But he took to him Jezebel. No subject or principle bears upon the Christian's life more than sin. For the Christian to remain faithful unto God, he or she must recognize the proper disposition or attitude that he or she is to have toward sin. May we never be guilty of winking at or by taking any token minimizing sin. Do not deny its reality or its ugliness. You know, it's somewhere along here that made me think of an old country song uh, performed by Cal Smith, one of the old time singers. And one of the lines in the song was, uh, he was being confronted by what he called, a, what he called her? Anyway, he didn't have kind words for the woman that was being that was confronting him about hanging out in joints and running with girls and and drinking. He says, "I know I'm sinning," and but me, how do you say that? I know I'm sinning, but me and God, we're going to have a good talk tonight. And that's pretty much the attitude of a lot of people these days. Yeah, I know I'm sinning, but God will take care of it. He tells me he will. So you go ahead and party and have a big time on any Friday or Saturday night, and then you don't have to go to church anymore. Just go touch the television and pray for forgiveness. That's the mentality of the world. Reminds me of a fellow firefighter. He was of the Catholic faith. And when he involved himself in some, what he thought, shady business deal, he went to the little booth that they went to back in those days and had made his confession. And he would leave the little booth and everything's fine, copacetic. He's ready to go for another week. If he said things he shouldn't say, if he had a few toddies and got a little bit drunk, he'd go to the little booth. Of course, he made his big mistake when he told firefighters what he was doing. And he never, he never outlived that, but uh, that's another story too. But that is a mentality. Sin all you want to sin, but that's not God's mentality. I sin because I have not surrendered all. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now, what that got to mean to me and to you is anything that will keep us away from God, anything that will destroy our Christianity, what should we do with it? What was he told to do with it? Sell it and give it to the poor. Now, it wasn't because it was he was wrong for having money. It was because that was his downfall. Christ knew that. Christ knew that that was what he needed to do to make his life right. may not be true with you. You may not need to sell your house, your boat, your car, or whatever you've got. But if it's between you and God, you better sell it. Give it away, throw it away, burn it up, whatever. But it's between you and God. The principle is 
surrender all and get rid of it. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I love that old song, and it. if you think about it while you're singing it, when we do sing it, it makes you wonder, you ask yourself, have I, how much of this have I done? How much of this have I surrendered? All to Him I freely give. All, my, all that I am, all that I'm capable of, I freely give. Uh, we will question ourselves if we ask that. I sin because I do not hate sin. Let love be without dissimulation, that is hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. The word abhor is to dislike, have a horror of. If, or rather, if ye that love the Lord hate evil, he preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hands of the wicked. Hate evil. Do you just avoid evil out of fear or do I hate it? Hmm. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Psalms 101 and 3. It will not cleave to me, meaning it will not get a hold on me. I do not hate sin is the reason I sin. Hate the evil, love the good, and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts shall be with you as you have spoken. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all the appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Otherwise, it's damnation rather than sanctification. <clears throat> Pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sin doesn't just happen. These are some of the causes of sin. There are others. So we should consider these things daily, constantly if necessary, keeping the causes of sin before us that we may avoid them. And we probably don't think as much about that as we should. Keeping things that uh, that are alluring and enticing, keeping those things in mind to avoid them rather than seeking them out. Any comments? We've got a few minutes. I don't know how many. Looks like a couple. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter because I'm done. You can dim the light. Y'all can go where you want to go. Thank you.